Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniela Vancic. I work for Democracy International. We're based here in Cologne, Germany, uh, where we promote specifically direct democracy at all levels of participation. Uh, so it's actually perfect that I'm the third speaker because I'm speaking about all the points that have already been, been touched upon briefly. Um, but I want to speak about two points specifically. Uh, the first about an existing tool, um, that's the European Citizens Initiative, but to build on what has already just been said and to look at uh, the, the ECI forum in more detail as a support tool uh, for organizers. And um, as a second um, point, a not yet existing tool or opportunity, let's call it, uh, the Conference on the Future of Europe, which we've mentioned a few times already tonight. Um, now about the first point, well, we, we don't have real direct democracy in the EU yet. Um, we do have something very close and that's the European Citizens Initiative, which uh, in its founding is inspired by the Swiss tools of direct democracy. Um, and it's true that nothing like this exists anywhere else in the world, um, not on the transnational level for sure. It, it truly is unique, um, but as you might have heard, it's not always easy to run an initiative. Uh, just this morning, uh, actually at a session of ECI week, we were discussing the, the best tips and practices on online campaigning for an ECI, uh, especially given the, the current situation. You can't really go out on the street and, and collect signatures <laughs> or go to events anymore. Um, but even before COVID, running a transnational campaign and using a tool that is um, unfortunately not so well known by the general European public, it definitely poses its challenges. So uh, first I want to talk about a support infrastructure tool of the ECI, and that's the ECI forum. Um, and I'll talk about some of the support features it offers for current organizers or even future organizers or people who are just uh, thinking of, of launching an initiative or just simply interested in the, the process itself. Um, but just quickly about um, what our role is on this forum and a bit about uh, its history. Um, we as Democracy International are subcontracted under ECAS actually to carry out uh, certain parts of the forum. Um, so it is an official website of the European Union, but it has NGO support in the content management and organizer support side. So in the background, it's, it's NGOs who are, um, who are kept keeping this, this uh, website alive. Uh, it was last year a pilot project, um, and as of January 1st of this year, it was fully implemented. Um, as part of the new regulation of the ECI. Um, the regulation are like the rules of the game for how to campaign. Um, and uh, the new regulation says that the, the commission will set up an online collaborative platform is what it's called uh, of the ECI. And that's exactly what um, we received here as part of a support package to campaigners. That's what we have now, the ECI forum. So um, we as civil society organizations that are involved with the ECI for a very long time, actually the very founding of Democracy International is in, in the ECI. Um, we have wanted to see something like this for a very long time, a, a platform where all current or former or even future organizers can gather and, and exchange ideas. So this is the homepage of, of, um, of the forum. This website is, is of course available in every official language of the EU. Um, the screenshot that Petar just showed you was from the pilot project. As you can see, it received a little bit of a, a glow up since then. So um, it does look a little bit more campaigner friendly, which is exactly what, what we need to uh, support for, for campaigners. Um, this is the homepage, um, um, just the basic homepage things. At the, at the bottom we have blogs. These are opinion pieces by different writers. Sometimes they are current organizers who are making um, a case for their idea. Uh, sometimes um, about the ECI uh, as a tool itself, um, calling for a reform of the ECI. As we can see here, um, some offer tips or advice for current organizers. I wrote this blog piece here. Um, and if, if you're going to want to know about initiatives specifically, which ones are currently running and which initiatives you can sign right now, you'll want to go to the official register of the ECI page. You can always find that if you scroll all the way to the bottom. So this is the official then um, the website. That's where then you, the, you can get all, all that information actually sign ECIs. But this page is, is for, um, for organizers or potential organizers, people who just want to get more information um, from an organizational or campaigning point of view. Um, this feature here, Learn, is where you can get, uh, as soon as it loads, this is where you can get all of your, your how-tos, um, your guidance notes, um, webinars on, on different topics of the ECI. Um, they're also archived here, so you can always visit this page to learn about the ECI generally as a tool, uh, about uh, 
what campaigning for an ECI entails, what are you going to get yourself into, <laughs> because it's going to be a long and possibly expensive year for campaigning um, and those sorts of things. Uh, there are also success stories that, that you can read here uh, about the successes that four um, successful ECIs have followed, uh, their strategies um, to reach the 1 million signatures in one year. Uh, more will be added here soon as of just as recently. As of this year, um, two more initiatives have submitted and verified their signatures. So this will be updated um, and discussed. This was also briefly mentioned by, by Petar. Um, this is really like the forum part of the forum. Um, here you can propose a discussion topic. Uh, perhaps you have an idea for an ECI and just want to test uh, the waters a bit with the ECI community. You can do that here and say, um, hey, I have an initiative idea about um, free movement, uh, for example, as we see here, you can ask, what do you all think about it? Would you, who would want to support this with me? Um, and for this feature, you to, to be able to post um, and to comment, you would have to create a form account and be logged in, but um, that's free and, e and easy to do. It's just a, just a registration. Um, and then the connect feature, uh, this is the, the section where you can, well, literally, as it says, connect with the different users. Um, maybe you saw that they, they posted something in the discuss section. You want to ask them about their campaign. Um, maybe you saw they posted a blog article and you, you, you want to follow up with them on this. So this is a really great way to, to connect with other experts in a, a certain field that you're looking into. Uh, this is also a good feature because when you, when you launch an initiative, you will um, need to have a group of seven organizers to launch with. Um, and these names have to be submitted to the European Commission along with your proposal. So you're essentially launching as a group of, of campaigners. And so you can use this feature, for example, to find those other campaigners or organizers. Um, for this, you will also would have to register. And now um, this seek advice, this is in my opinion, probably uh, the most practical feature offered. If you are um, getting ready to launch an initiative or maybe you've already launched and you need some advice, um, you can consult the forum. You can uh, ask your question through uh, a form here and receive expert tailor-made uh, advice on campaigning, fundraising, or uh, legal advice. And you'll receive that within about a week. Uh, this has been used um, 36 times just now in, in, in 2020 alone. And remember, we were doing this last year as a pilot project too. So um, this is actually inspired by a service that Democracy International and ECAS and uh, Initiative and Referendum Institute were offering for years to, to ECI uh, organizers, um, but now we've just officialized it. So um, those are the major features behind the ECI forum. Again, um, just such a unique, a unique tool like the ECI would really require this kind of channel and platform in order to build a community around this tool. And it's really great that something like this now finally uh, exists. So I will... Stop sharing my screen here. Okay, um, so that's that, that was the first point. Um, now uh, I want to switch the focus completely <laughs> to a totally different point. Uh, we, we just talked about the, the, the ECI, which is of, of course existing right now. Uh, it's a right of all EU citizens. Um, but I want to talk about a participatory opportunity that um, should just as equally interest and excite all European citizens. Uh, and that's the conference on the future of Europe that has been mentioned a few times already tonight. Um, so a little bit of the background of, of this conference um, and what makes it so, so exciting. Uh, this was announced last year by uh, Commission President uh, von der Leyen um, in her political guidelines that a conference on the future of Europe would be uh, set up, would launch on Europe Day 2020, so on, on May 9th, and run for two years. Um, and this would be all done as a, as a push for a new European democracy, where, where citizens would be um, called equal partners in discussing the future of Europe with uh, decision makers. And um, what's more is that she said discussions at this conference would, um, could include topics that would require treaty change. And this is um, big news in the EU institutions, as the, the words treaty change were, um, were really avoided at all costs. I mean, nobody wanted to open the... Uh, the, the Pandora's box of the bureaucracy and the complicated <laughs> legalities that would come with treaty change. Um, and while this conference is not the route for treaty change directly, it's not a uh, Article 48 convention process, 
but what it could be is it could be a catalyst for for treaty change um, an example um, it could be that an outcome of the conference would be that in order to re reach results uh, X, Y, and Z, whatever the conference uh, agrees, that we will need treaty change for it. And then uh, the institutions might launch an official treaty change process in according to Article 48. So this was really exciting for, for us at, at Democracy uh, International, as we've been calling for a treaty change process, at least a review into the, the current treaties. Um, for years now and we we like the fact that citizens would be brought in as equal partners in co-creating potentially maybe a new treaty for um for the eu uh this excited many other civil society organizations as well um and especially that this was going to be the flagship project of um this uh, commission uh but uh, as a few months went on um and there was no more news and very little movement on, on the topic. Um, each in institution was preparing their own position on the, on the conference and how um, the conference should run. For example, treaty change was not that welcomed by the, co the council. And then of course the pandemic hit. So needless, needless to say that the conference in the future of Europe did not begin on May 9th, 2020 uh, on Europe day as expected. Um, but it wasn't so much because of the pandemic, but mostly because the, the institutions couldn't come to an agreement on how the conference should be run and who should be the chair or the president of the conference and the details like that. So um, all these civil society organizations that were looking forward to this conference, um, we, we came together and we, we formed what uh, is called uh, the Citizens Take Over Europe Coalition. Um, we are also campaigning that essentially we're advocating for a citizens-centered conference on the future of Europe, um, the one that was promised to us last year. Um, and we've been a really active coalition since March. Um, we are now about 50 organizations that have uh, focused on advocacy and policy monitoring while also making our positions known on how the conference in the future of Europe should run. Um, we have some experts on citizens' participation in our coalition. And we have, uh, since then, we have also launched an open letter to Angela Merkel, as, as Germany has the current uh, EU Council Presidency, and to all three institutions. Um, we have also published a 10-point guiding principles document about how a citizens-focused conference should be run. Um, so democratic, transparent, accountable, and so on. And more recently, we have also um, launched an official petition to the European Parliament, and we're re um, just waiting for a response um, there now. Um, we've also had a few events. Our first kickoff event was on, on Europe Day, uh, the original date that the, the conference should have started. And we will now um, have our next event beginning of December, where we will have also a self-organized uh, public hearing on the petition that we submitted to the parliament um, since there's been quite of a delay there. So we're taking that up in, in, in our own hands and doing like a self-organized mock uh, public hearing where we're still inviting all of the, the members of the, the Petit Committee of the European Parliament. Uh, so in the, the very first Slido poll that we were, um, we were shown uh, on which instruments of EU participation have used so far, um, just as a, as a new coalition with Citizens Take Over Europe, we have um, access uh, six of these instruments or, or methods listed. Um, of course, the easy ones, the exchange with, with MEPs, um, we, we invited them to speak at our events, but we also had many exchanges with them and many MEPs are fully supportive of um, civil society's push for a democratic and transparent conference on the future of Europe, um, contacting the institutions, uh, of course, accessing documents. Um, as far as public consultation, we have not accessed this because there was no public consultation launched on, on the conference. Um, but what we're actually doing is creating our own uh, online public consultation on how the conference should be run uh, in order to crowdsource ideas and, and to gather some, um, some input. We think that the, the institutions should actually launch an online public consultation before starting the conference. Um, there are public consultations on all sorts of issues, which is, which is really great. But then it should definitely launch a consultation on a on a conference which is meant to involve citizens at the at the very core. So um, uh, this is something that is would be really a missed opportunity if there's no public consultation loss from from the the institutions on, on this. Um, but that's why we're we're doing this as an initiative of, of civil society. Um, also, what we've used is petitions to the European Parliament, as, as mentioned, um, that was also on the list in, in our poll. Um, so we've just launched that about last last month. Um, and the, the last one was the conference on the future of Europe. We'll, 
yes, of course, this didn't start yet, but we are uh, advocating for it ahead of its implementation and making sure that at least in, in this phase where we're talking about how the conference should be run or that's being done by the institutions, that it, at least that they will be um, co-designing that with citizens. That's really what we're calling for at this point is co-design the conference with citizens. Um, we have all this time citizens are, are at home. Um, we're uh, reachable digitally, as, as was mentioned also by Petar. And so this would be really the perfect opportunity to, to co-design with citizens and consult the citizens on, on how to run this conference that could be really historic for Europe. Um, so just as um, some, some final words on, on the conference, it's, it's true, no one knows yet how it will look like or how the conference will run or what structure it will have exactly. Um, but if it's, if it's going to be a real attempt to bring in citizens into the decision-making process, then it really offers a, a unique opportunity for, for citizens to be on the same playing field as the European institutions and to really design the future of Europe that we want from a citizen's perspective and civil society uh, support behind it. So um, that's, uh, that's it for now and I look forward to your questions. Wow, amazing, uh, Daniela, thanks a lot. Um, this actually reminds me of the very last question that we received uh, after Peter's presentation, where uh, somebody anonymous asked us if uh, e-participation didn't actually make it necessary to further decentralize the institutions. Uh, which would bring the union closer to, to its citizens. Uh, if you could imagine now in, in a minute uh, your, I don't know, your, your perfect uh, conference on the future of Europe, would it actually include um, possibilities for, for citizens to, for example, physically also participate in their cities? Um, how, could we, how would it look like if it, if it was a painting, let's say? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, a, per a perfect conference in the future of Europe would be hybrid, actually would take part also in person because nothing really beats that face to face uh, interaction and for something that will be so transnational. Um, that'd be really great to have that. What we also advocate for, and this is also in the, the opinion of the European Parliament, um, these agoras that were mentioned uh, also by Petar. So these would be, um, these could be like randomly selected citizens agoras, um, random selection by, by sortition, just like done um, in Ireland for the Irish Citizens Assemblies, for example, in France for the, the climate assemblies. Um, and as a coalition with Citizens Take Over Europe, we're really a fan of, of random selection. This is a great way to bring people who are maybe not so involved in the political sphere from all corners of Europe to bring them together, to meet face to face, to discuss uh, the future of Europe that we want to, to learn also more about Europe. Um, I think you can't beat that face to face um, contact, but of course that's not possible right now and that's um, I'm totally realistic about that. That's why now is the time to really launch at least the digital point uh, part of it. So it should be run hybrid. Um, like right now since it's the conference has not started, we are at um, what a, uh, about eight month delay since the original start date or so. Um, now is really the time to let's let's put it on pause then. We don't need to rush it, but let's do it well. Um, so let's co-design it. How should this look like? Even the in-person meetings, even the, the hybrid meetings, um, the, the online meetings, how should this look like? And let's do that also with the citizens and design it. 